it's important to have uh, folks, who, again, with lived experience and who are from communities that are most affected by these issues at the table advocating for solutions. I grew up in poverty. It was incredibly challenging watching my mother navigate, you know, the system um, on social assistance. was It was near impossible for her, you know. There were days um, eventually where we had no heat, no hot water, no electricity. It was when I was 13 years old where I recognized that you know, a lot of what we were experiencing had very little to do with our family, but were rooted in political decisions that were being made in the halls of power. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Is That Proud Black Woman? And I totally forgot to do the intro on my drive to work, so yeah, here it is. So before we get started, please subscribe, like share share with your family your friends all your contacts your enemies your frenemies and encourage them to also subscribe so that we can move this channel forward okay thank you for all of you that have been loyal that has been watching all my videos leaving comments and following me on instagram and on facebook much love to you so uh today uh i just decided to listen to the radio on my way to work which i do er pretty much every day on my way to work and this very important um uh interview started so i couldn't do like an intro so i just quickly put on put on my phone which was talking about anti-black racism here in canada like about a research that the university of toronto had done and they interviewed another uh guy um right now i don't know the name off the top of my head but i'm sure you're going to hear the name while we're listening to the radio so it's just me taking a drive to work listening to the radio and bringing you along with me so enjoy love this presents a really interesting moment because early in the 1980s canada began to try food charity as a response to these sorts of issues around poverty and hunger but the pandemic has really pushed the government to acknowledge the importance of income-based intervention so really hope that uh, we don't go back to the over reliance on based charity when it comes to addressing issues like uh, uh, poverty and food insecurity. What are you hearing from low-income families in this city? Well, we're hearing that, uh, you know, food is often treated as a flexible expenditure. We know that for folks, and so what ends up happening uh, for low-income folks is that people are forced to make sacrifices when it comes to paying for food, paying for other, other necessities like their shelter or housing costs, child care and utilities. more aggregately, we know that if someone lives in a lone parent household, they're more likely to be food insecure than if they're a dual parent household. For black Canadians, it didn't matter. The prevalence remained high. We looked at immigration status, whether or not someone was born in Canada or born abroad, how long they had been in the country, yeah. it didn't matter. As long as someone was black, the prevalence remained high. There were a couple other things that we looked at as well here that were really shocking. We've commonly understood in this country that, um, you know, if you own a home, you're less likely to be food insecure. 
Well, we actually found when we look specifically at the experiences of black homeowners, their rates of food insecurity are identical, pretty much identical to white renters in this country. Really? Wow. Why is that? You know, it's, that, that, that's a great question. And that's <laughs> what we're exactly. trying to tease out. And ultimately, there is no other reason than being racialized as black and then uh, systemic uh, anti-black racism within all of our institutions. Even, yeah. I'll give you one more example, if I may. Even when we look at social assistance in this country, because that was one of the things we were, we were exploring in this research, white Canadians actually receive more money on social assistance than black Canadians, which seems odd because, you know, it seems like some sort of equation. What we realized was that uh, disability income was included in that. So the research is telling us that white folks are not only more likely to be approved for disability, but they're more likely to be approved for higher amounts. You recently had a piece in Toronto Life about growing up in poverty. You're you're familiar with this scenario. So how does that experience shape the work that you do? Well, it's, you know, I work with a person team at food share, and I think we're in a really unique position. Because when you think about the issue of food insecurity and poverty in this country, we know that Indigenous communities, Black communities, disproportionately experience food insecurity in Canada. But when we look at who's tasked with the solution finding, both in government and in nonprofit organizations, it's predominantly white folks. The larger the budget, the more likely it is to be white men. Yeah. So it's super important, I think, for folks that have lived experience recognize the urgency of food insecurity and also are, are more willing to push me perhaps a, a little bit deeper to say, you know, some of the food based programs, while they're important and respond to food insecurity, it's really important that we don't position them as a solution to food insecurity because then we're letting governments off the hook who have the capacity to set minimum wage, the appropriate minimum wage legislation, introduce things like a basic income. So uh, I'm seeing that with the um, black led food insecurity organizations organizations that are saying, you know what, this is a crisis, it's a crisis in our communities, mm -hmm. and we can't pretend that the work in the community food sector is solving this crisis. We need a seat at the table. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, one other thing, if we have some time that jumps out to me, around the difference around leadership, what happens here is, you know, there's a lot of conversation in the community food security space advancing, uh, you know, the idea that a universal basic income is going to have a significant impact. And yes, I, I agree that it's one of the tools that will help address food insecurity in this country. But it reminds me of the privilege uh, and, and, in essence, the whiteness around these decision tables because, yes, a basic income is a wonderful go-forward intervention, but it doesn't acknowledge the, you know, um, multi-generational, intergenerational impact of loss of wealth, impact on health that Black Canadians and Indigenous Canadians and Indigenous folks have, have been, have had bestowed upon them. Yes. So we also need to be talking about things like reparations and a go-forward approach. So I think it's important to have uh, folks, who, again, with lived experience and who are from communities that are most affected by these issues at the table advocating for solutions. And the ability to break the cycle. Yes. I mean, you grew up in poverty, so you know how difficult it is to break that cycle. Mm -hmm. I do, you know, I grew up in poverty. It was incredibly challenging watching my mother navigate, you know, the system um, on social assistance was it was near impossible for her. You know, there were days um, eventually where we had no heat, no hot water, no electricity. Wow. But you know, part of what inspires my commitment to this work is, you know, was when I was 13 years old, where I recognized that, you know, a lot of what we were experiencing had very little to do with our family, but were rooted in political decisions that were being made in the halls of power. It was when Mike Harris came to power in uh, 1995, I was 13, one of the first things he did under the guise of a common sense revolution was cut welfare by 22%. <laughs> and I remember asking my mother and engaging in lots of conversation about what does that mean for us? And what does that mean for other families that are struggling right now? And, you know, I, that's what really has committed me to doing what I can and, uh, alongside my colleagues to actually go beyond Band-Aid solutions and identify and challenge those systems that not only create poverty, but also that hold people in poverty. Paul Taylor, I appreciate this conversation. Thank you so much.
My pleasure. Thanks for having me this morning. Paul Taylor is the executive director of the nonprofit Food Share. Wow. You know, and people still say that there's no uh, institutional uh, bias, no institutional racism. And this that we just listened to on the radio is uh, a research that was done by University of Toronto. And University of Toronto is a prestigious university, so they're not going to bring out any, um, they won't bring out any conclusions from their research if it wasn't true, if they didn't like really do the research properly. So I believe what this, they're saying, and I want you to listen to that and see that, yeah, the fear of people of color is actually real because these things happen. So I'm already at work now. Thank you for taking the ride to, uh, with me to work, listening to the radio. Every time I, uh, that's the only time I get the chance on the radio, uh, like to listen to the radio because who has a radio at home? Anytime I'm going to work or when I'm coming back from work, that's when I get the chance to listen to the radio. And I just got to work, so I'm just going to park my car. So remember to subscribe. Make sure you hit the like button and please share with your friends and family. Let them also subscribe, okay? Encourage them to subscribe. The sun is getting in my eye and today there's a heat warning out for i think from now till next week because it's going to be 31 degrees and being 31 degrees is not even the problem it's the humidity because it makes it so hot and where i work i work uh, health and safety i feel for the people that works on the floor because it's so hot there like i could bet it's about 40 something degrees <laughs> indoors like even if it's not that much it feels like that so please guys stay hydrated if there's no reason for you to go in the sun stay home until like in the evening where you can take a walk okay all right love you guys see you in my next video Mwah.